kind of the annual like um, internal. Will, will they like, nominate the Super Mario movie as Best Picture next year? <laughs> <laughs> And welcome to Pop Cultural Marxism. This is a podcast from the Book Institute for Social Research. Uh, my name is Jay Singh Chaudhary, and I am joined, as always, by Izzy Litka. Hello. And this is our sixth episode, um, tentatively titled, although we reserve uh, the opportunity to maybe change that title as things go on, uh, Not Letting People Enjoy Things, um, as inspired by uh, the recent discussions around the Oscars, which was just a couple of weeks ago from when we're recording, um, and in particular, the film Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Um, but And the, we'll try to get into a little bit of the history of the Oscars and awards and all this jazz uh, and also the origin of this meme and why it's so critically flawed and a lot of aspects of this movie. But before then, Izzy, is there anything you wanted to bring up to people either lingering from last time or new news items? Um, only that I have uh, just seen the trailer for a uh, German... Adapta uh, German German English adaptation um, of Mozart's The Magic Flute, uh, produced by Roland Emmerich of Independence Day fame, directed by Florian Seigel, Siegel, um, and uh, starring, among others, uh, F. Murray Abraham, who, <laughs> for some reason, has signed on to a project that I can only describe as the young adultification of The Magic Flute. Um, the premise is that uh, students at a um, uh, boarding school of some sort. Um, wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. Are you going to show me this trailer, by the way? I will. Okay. Students at a boarding school of some sort find out that one of the clocks is a portal to the universe of the magic flute. Oh my God. So it's like a meta story of the magic flute. It's a meta story of the magic flute. That's trying to capitalize on the boarding Lying school. Witch in the wardrobe that, bullshit. Right. Or the Harry Potter yeah. or Wednesday or, you know, any number of kind of recent Netflix shows, but it looks atrocious. <laughs> and you, you and I both love a great sort of weird classical music biopic. We both love Amadeus. Yes, that's I right. love Ken Russell's Mahler. And I love, um, there are like great opera adaptations, right? Joseph Losey's Don Giovanni is really fantastic. Um, Ingmar, Berg Ingmar Bergman's The Magic Flute is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. But this. Well, I have to see it now. Or do you have it on your machine? I do have it. Can I see it? Uh, yeah. This is fucking terrible. <laughs> But, sorry, this is the thing where they're not using Mozart. Like, there's some themes, but not actual scores. Well, like, that's the Queen of the Night yes. aria. Oh, my God. Every bit of this fucking is like It makes me want to die. Fucking heart. Oh, my God. That's so fucking brutal. And so my question is, why? <laughs> I mean, I think the answer, the, the question with these things now is more, why not? They will mine anything i think the thing that blows my mind here that they have the, like it's like pre-done right it's already a, an opera that was in its in its composition and in its reception a popular opera it is not like a piece of music or a piece of theater that like is aggressively hard or something like this. Right, um, right. And yet they felt the need to like create something it's, about the music in particular really just kills me because they basically like stuck on what's his name? Horner. Do you know who I'm talking about? Like a James Horner style, mm -hmm. like adaptation of a few themes from Mozart and then just some generic ass sort of like, you know, like, uh, fantasy action movie like soundtrack bullshit. So the wiki says that there are 17 arias from Mozart that are okay. featured in the film performed by individual actors. Okay. So it seems like there will be 
There is some Mozart in there. And it was clear. The Queen of the Night, the famous aria from yeah, The Queen yeah. of the Night was there. But like in the like incidental music. Yes. In yes, the yes. in the what's the what's the phrase in, in opera scoring? It's not recitative. It's the Oh Mark, you would know this. Oh Mark's got his headphones on. It depends what yeah, it doesn't genre. matter. Whatever. <laughs> Let's so it's not just the the aria themes, right? Um I mean like the like Overall, there there is like a whole set of compositions they could just be using, and they're just not. Yes, <laughs> but also this fr- this framing device. I yes, it's so strange to me that um, this insistence that kind of only through this sort of recognizable young adult uh, structure, sort of that 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 is enough to compel people to be interested in the magic flute. I mean, as someone who loves teen dramas, who will like go to the mat on like the OC being a great TV show, like, or like, I don't know now two and O or, uh, What's my tr- my true favorite? Uh, my so-called life. Right. Like I will go to the mat on these being fascinating TV shows. And I have on various this or podcasts in the past, um, but it just seems kind of unnecessary here. Yes. Like even if you just wanted to throw kids at this thing, like have at it. It's not actually like a very cogent text. No, it's like, fairy you tales. You can do all. Ki- yeah. It's ju- it's just fairy tales. I mean, with this weird kind of like Masonic Quasi-Masonic. overlay that no yeah, one really yeah. really wants to deal with, um, and it was in fact. I mean, historically, I think the thing that's so interesting to me is that um, this was a, a, I think Mozart's first major composition exclusively not for the court. It was exclusively for popular theater. Um, and written as such. Um, and it's also very, very good. Right. Uh, and whoever's doing this adaptation seems to just not know or care. Like, I, it's not hard to sell people on the magic flute because, because it's very fun and very good. And very magical. <laughs> the magic is there already. Yeah. <laughs> it's often there on stage. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, so this this depresses me both as a classical music fan and as a dour critic of television culture. Uh, and a, a good example of not letting people... I, we don't know uh, if people actually like this yet. This is only out in Europe right now. Right. I don't plan to let people enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> um my, I don't, uh, there's a lot in the like news news, but uh, in terms of cultural news, um, the, the item, yeah, we're not going to be able to go into like IPC synthesis reports or like geopolitics uh, on this podcast. But um, in terms of cultural items, uh, something that was on my radar and that I've been enjoying a lot and also I think abridges a couple of our conversations that reach back to our last episode when we were talking about uh, things like Bridgerton and po- plastic representation and also bridge into today's discussions with things like fandoms and things like that. I've been playing a video game uh, called Like a Dragon Ishin. Um, this is by a Japanese uh, game studio called Ryu Ga Go. Toku, um, which means like a dragon uh, in Japanese, although I probably just butchered it really badly. Um, In English, these games have always been translated as Yakuza and were sort of market positioned as the sort of Japanese answer to Grand Theft Auto, which they are not. Um, In fact, they are like almost always about like sort of like heroes, like, like what's it called? Flawed heroes with a heart of gold kind of thing. Um... And uh, they're really actually a wonderful set of games. Sega owns this studio now. And um, this one, though, is really interesting. It was originally released in 2014, the version that has been, uh, it's been updated and re-released. Um, interestingly, uh, only in Japanese. So you can get it in the US, but it only has subtitles. Um, and it is a costume drama. Um, so it's set, it uses a lot of the character faces, the actors mm-hmm. from the, from the Yakuza series. Um, but it's, uh, they are all playing out, um, the period of Japanese history that happens right after the American, um, uh, quote unquote opening, right. With the, the black ships, right. Basically advanced American warships for the era show up at Japanese harbors and are like, if you do not join the world market, we will blow you up. Um, 
you can imagine historically and in the game, this leaves people uh, very anxious and concerned about their society and what is happening. And one of the things that's really fascinating about this game, in addition to being pretty fun if you like this style of game, um, it has a lot of silly elements that are very fun, very, very, very much a part of the Yakuza series. Um, essentially, the day, the day to day in this is everything from sort of beat em ups. There's even like a farming sim in there. There's a dungeon crawler. There's all kinds of crazy shit going on. But um, right, mostly it, one thing that's very fascinating is that unlike a lot of games, sort of politics stuff, this is a dealing with a historical moment, and it actually takes a fairly What's the word I'm looking for? Despite having a lot of like absurd gameplay things, it takes a fairly serious approach to mm -hmm. relating the history of this period. And a lot of characters talk about, you know, the things like class inequality, about uh, questions of nationalism, colonialism, imperialism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the funny thing is a lot of the critical response was like, this game is very good. It would have been great, though, if it didn't end. Sorry, spoiler, if you're going to play this game, but also it's history. Like, if it didn't end with the main characters essentially all being like, well, clearly the path forward is like nationalist imperialism. And like, what's funny to me about this as a criticism of this game is what on earth did people want this to end with? Like some kind of bizarre alternative, alternative history? Universe. Like it, the fact that it ends in this right wing way, this it, uh, is a true to history, but also like it would like fall apart if you tried to tell the story in a different way. And a, a similar criticism that's been made of this game, actually I feel like it's not 100% fair, because um, there are a couple characters that break out of this, like they're trying to do their best, is that like they are bringing these characters from later games into it, um, so why couldn't they you know, make a more diverse cast? Why couldn't there be more women in positions of power in the game, et cetera, et cetera? And it, this is another version we have of that like Bridgerton effect or whatever we want to call it, right? Where um, there's an intense desire, and I do think this abuts the like let people like things, or, right? Um, mm -hmm, this intense for sure. desire for the objects of my consumption to reflect me. Um, as like uh, as my subjectivity, as opposed to me being like, oh, um, this very very relatable character, um, the who is a historical figure. By the way, you're playing, mm -hmm. a, 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 I think, a, a, I think either an, a, either a synthesis or a straight up historical figure from the period, who seems to be a relatively nice person. That they end up becoming hardcore nationalists mm -hmm. is not, in fact, problematic. Like it is the way history unfolded there. And like the discomforting aspect of that should in fact make you queasy, right? You, it, you can't solve the historical problem through its mm -hmm. obfuscation. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think on the one hand, you're right, there's this question of um, this kind of desire for one's objects of cultural consumption to reflect them. And this question that I think will keep coming up today, which is, um, what is it about this moment that yeah. make that that is so um, that uh, what is it about this moment that makes people so desirous of cultural objects that ultimately console? Or yes, that, that's that, really good. Almost like the theodicy or the consolation. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, I think, I think we'll talk about this in, as we get to some of the feedback of uh, the, the criticism and, and response to the criticism of, of everything everywhere all at once. Um, but it is interesting to me that I think it's, it's this reaction is sort of falls into this broader cultural phenomenon of that. I think, you know, it reflects something real about the, the conditions in which people seek kind of cultural objects and sort of, yeah. um, and, and maybe we can we can sort of flesh out some of that as we um, yeah as we I mean my film. only parting thought on this is I um, you know I'm, I would I don't want to take this off the table I feel like this could be something we talk about in a in a later episode I I I think this game is very good and I think it's particular history mm -hmm. um, where when it was made um, where and when it was made it was assumed that no uh, no one outside of Japan would want to play this game. And even the version that we now have is like 
I was saying this to Izzy before the show, like uh, you can like push a button whenever it's talking about like intricate Japanese history stuff. You almost wish it was a little better, but like it'll mm-hmm. be like, oh, the thing being talked about here is this like, I, there's stuff in there I just did not know. Or it's like, oh, there was actually like 13 different subcategories of samurai. Mm-hmm. And now we're going to tell you all those 13 different like mm-hmm. cast identities for like the, for, for the different kinds of like feudal order samurai. And you're like, holy shit, mm-hmm. like what mm-hmm. the fuck? Um, and it's actually like the thing that's most exciting from a critical perspective about that kind of, of game for me is in fact like, oh my God, you can do costume drama in video games. Um, and it's like, that seems to be being missed in favor of, I want this to sort of this object, yeah, to reflect exactly, uh, the world I wish I lived in. Mm -hmm. Mm, That's good. And also reminds me that I guess I, a smaller news item is that I recently finally played um, Return to the Obra Dinn. Oh, we talked about um, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, um, which I, you thought think? Was, I thought it was a lot of fun. I think it's, I think it's really juicy that you play as, uh, as an insurance inspector for the, for the uh, Dutch East India Company. I just had my students reading Kafka's uh, own um, insurance yes, yes, risk assessments exactly. uh, uh, alongside uh, looking at, um, what's it called? Uh, the end of the castle and um, sorry to bother you in my Kafka class this week. Mm. And it was so fucking crazy productive, but yes. No, this is, I mean, this is exactly what I was thinking of as I, as I played that um, so much of, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a, it's a kind of puzzle logic game, but so much of what's interesting about this historical piece of it for me is the, um, the sort of, um, almost a kind of unsatisfying bureaucratic closure to the story uh, that I yes. think really reflects that for me is kind of so much more illuminating than something that would have been like, you know, than having a pat end it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I don't want to like, Oh, like dive into the stuff I've been teaching kids in Kafka class, but it does jibe really well with the fact that like all of those great, like the big three Kafka novels are all unfinished. They mm. all lack a, like a sort of stru- they, and people have written a lot about this, like in like, relation to his, is it a structural flaw? I, I see. I see. Like, yeah, is yeah, this yeah. a flaw or is this in fact part of what, it, like there is a kind of impossibility to finish those novels. And I tend to lean towards the latter. Yeah. Like they're not really, they don't have the structure of novels. Um, that's part of their power. Right. That's part of why they work. Right. Um, the castle literally, at least in the contemporary translations, I think the Max Broad version was like so abridged that even early people were like, come on. Um, but like the version that we have of the castle literally just stops mid sentence, like in the middle of a thought, um, which is perfect if you read that book because it's mostly these long rambling monologues of people just failing to communicate to right, each other. Right, right, right. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it is wild to read Kafka's insurance yeah. reports because he is basically like, do you ever notice that like everyone's just getting out of the risk assessments for not actually changing like workplace safety conditions? It's just wild to read this stuff. And, yeah. and, and he writes it, unlike the diaries, the letters, many of those other things, he writes it in the exact voice. It's uncanny. He writes it in the exact voice of uh, that he uses in his short stories and in his novels. Yeah. It is strange to have, not a lot of people I think could pull off the sort of fictionalization of their own professional, yes. their own professional l- language. I mean, I tried to, like, I, 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 we're now getting, doing the thing I didn't <laughs> want to do, but I told my students, like, I, I don't like skeleton key, of like course. this, like, I don't think the insurance reports are the skeleton key, but of all the mass of Kafka shit that people have published over the year, and I, you know, I loved reading, we talked about the diaries with Ross, and I loved reading the, the new versions and all that, but this material, man, oh, it is fucking wild. Like, it's just such an eye opener, right? Of like, not this sort of forward or even backward looking, but just what bureaucracy in a plain language from someone sort of stuck in the middle, very mm-hmm. much an outsider, right? He's the only Jew who works at this thing. He's very good at his job. He's very recognized. He's like the second in command, I think, by the time he dies. Uh, he does it basically his whole yeah, sort of his whole and professional career. Yeah, he's really career. good at yeah. it, and he also sees that it is like essentially like this bureau, this Workmen's Institute that's set up uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire to sort of mimic the Bismarckian welfare state. Um, 
has sort of irreconcilable goals yep. that only exist outside the wall. Yeah. It's, it's fucking brilliant. And I think that game, Oberdin, yeah. really gets at that very well yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, uh, let's take a small break. And when we return, we will discuss everything everywhere all, all at once. once. <laughs> Okay, and so as we said, today's episode is about not letting people enjoy things, um, and we're, our principal sort of tie is to the uh, recent uh, Best Picture uh, Academy Award winner, and we're going to talk, I think, a little bit about the Academy Awards and the Academy and this idea of Best Picture and all this jazz, but the film in question is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, the 2022 really it was 2022 mm -hmm. release right mm -hmm. um release uh by the daniels i believe is what they go on which is uh it's daniel kwan and daniel uh schneider 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 uh, steinhardt schnein schneider schneider okay this film stars uh michelle yo uh stephanie shu uh ki hoi kwan uh, Harry Shum Jr., Jamie Lee Curtis, and James Hong in his probably 800th movie role. He's been in everything. Oh, I actually didn't. He plays it. the grandfather. Oh, yeah, that guy is in everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and Michelle Yeoh, uh, yeah. I think we'll get into this, uh, not an unknown factor, especially no. not an unknown factor in the context of action cinema. Yes. Um, she has been making uh, action movies, particularly in the sort of Hong Kong, China universe since at least the 80s, right? Maybe even earlier? Early 80s, early 90s. I yeah, 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 yeah. In that period. Um, so very funny for me. Uh, so well, I think we'll just get into initial impressions mm -hmm. first. Um, I had not watched, someone said actually very early last year, I think someone, I remember having lunch with someone, they're like, I really love this movie. And it just sort of fell off my radar. Um, and then there was so much discourse around it leading up to and around the Oscars. And I will admit, I am not someone who watches the Oscars. Um, one of my favorite stories about the Oscars is th that I think pushed me over the edge. A, I just think they're meaningless garbage. All award shows basically meaningless garbage. Um, but uh, one of the, my favorite people I, I ever met um, was a poet who worked as a bartender. It was, he was a genius, so like amazing guy. Mm -hmm. uh, got fired by a bunch of angry Park Slope moms uh, who were upset that he was making jokes during the Oscars. That were funny jokes, I might add. And literally, they were like, uh, like, can I talk to the manager? And he got fired, like, the next day. Uh, because he was taking a He was taking American the piss team. at the Oscars. He's like, this is fucking bullshit. Uh, <laughs> anyway, nonetheless, there's been a sort of growing, let's call it, discourse in the Foucauldian sense uh, around this film. Is that fair? Sure. Um, and actually, the discourse is so strong... Uh, right, so the first person I heard this movie from, it's actually something I respect a lot, and they're like, it's a pretty good movie, Ajay, you should check it out. And then the discourse around this was so, uh, <laughs> I'm going to mix all my fandoms, right? The, the, the force was strong with, uh, with, this, uh, with, the, with the discourse, um, that this was this kind of like triumph of sort of the like breakthrough of genre and mm -hmm. particularly of superheroes, which is very funny because like genre films have been winning awards for like eons now. I don't know, whatever. Um, such that when I actually sat down to watch this movie, mm -hmm. um, I was actually surprised that I was like, oh, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> um, uh, it sort of borrows very heavily on, it reminds me very much, I was saying this to Izzy before, of um, Tarantino, 
um, and the way that, especially when he's doing his best work, uh, I think of things like Kill Bill um, or the first, um, his first breakthrough, what was it? Um, Pulp Fiction, where, when he really wears his, his uh, influences on his sleeve, it's mm. often very, uh, his best work. And this movie does the same. Um, and clearly uh, one of those influences uh, is, uh, that is a little bit lost in the, the, dis the powerful discourse is this uh, long tradition of uh, Jap uh, sorry Chinese uh, martial arts movies, and especially action comedies, mm -hmm. right? Thinking here of the work of people like Jackie Chan or Jet Li, uh, all these people that actually probably most uh, Anglophone listeners are familiar with their work. You've seen a Jet Li movie. You've seen a Jackie Chan movie. You've seen a Michelle Yeoh movie. She's not like some unknown person oh, yeah. who fell off a rock, right? She's been a movie star forever. So it sort of wears those on its sleeve very strongly. And also to me, it harkened back and that I had to look this up. It harkened back to um, a TV show that I really enjoyed from many years ago, not that many, like 2017, 2018, um, which is uh, uh, Noah Hawley's adaptation of the, uh, essentially it's an adaptation of like a very minor character in the Marvel X-Men sort of universe. Now, for those who follow like our ongoing uh, discussions of like Disney owning everything in the world, this is the one corner of the Marvel universe that they don't own and that they're only now sort of getting their grips on. Um, and one of the things that really stood out to me, well, I was watching this movie, I was like, wait a minute, this is just Legion plus Chinese action movies. Um, and it turns out that, um, Daniel Kwan had actually worked on Legion. So like the scenes in this film, for example, where like you switch languages or in which there is sort of multiple realities layered upon one another. People I think are connecting a lot to contemporary like multiverse stuff, but this is all there in Legion, um, which does a very different adaptation style than uh, the like what was to come later or in, what was happening concurrently with the MCU where the sort of weirdness is rounded off and made sort of palatable. Um, I actually cannot believe that Legion actually like made it on a onto TV and I think three or four seasons they actually made it to the conclusion of the damn story because it was fucking bizarre. And part of what made it work is that it successfully adapted the work of people like Jack Kirby, of people like Grant Morrison, all these fucking weirdos from comics. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did so instead of by being like, well, let's take this thing and make it more relatable. They're like, no, let's take this thing and make it as weird as possible. How can I take this two dimensional weird science fiction story and mm -hmm and make it work in a three-dimensional space. Well, they came up with things that I then saw again in everything ever all at once, like using still cinema. So the, uh, the one that stuck out to me was the use, for example, of the rocks that are talking to each other in, in, in text. Um, is, is an exact thing that was done in Legion. Um, the googly eyes, right? Like things that are appearing like for no apparently reason, no apparent reason in different universes. Like uh, all this kind of stuff is something that, that very much re reminded me of that. <clears throat> um, which is ironic because as far as I can tell, um, a lot of folks who are loving this movie um, seem to see it as a sort of a triumph, I don't know, Izzy, you can help me out here or something, like a triumph or like the sort of vindication mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of like, Mar of the sort of Marvel superhero genre. Right. Is that fair? I think so. Uh, I think at least part of, part of the reaction is also to the sense of um, sort of not, not unjustifiable sense that kind of a number of the actors involved sort of are at last getting their due from kind of Hollywood well, yes. institutions. And we'll get to that later. Oh, I was going um, to say, I invite you just to... Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of... Is, is there anything else about your reaction to the film? Yeah, we can come back to it. It's fine. Okay, so I mean, my I'll, I'll give my initial impressions to the film. Um, I... I thought it was. I thought it was pretty good. Um, I yeah, think, pretty good is right. Yeah, yeah. It's so, like totally fine. I think. <laughs> I think when it works best, it works best as um, really a, a love letter to Hong Kong cinema yeah. and to Michelle Yeoh's career. Um, yeah. You know, in a number of her early works like Magnificent Warriors, Yes, Madam, um, The Holy Weapon, to Wong Kar Wai, of course. Yep. Um, 
and to uh, as well as um, uh, a number of the films that kind of James Hong was in, Big Trouble in Little China. Is oh yeah, what's um, that? What year is that? Do you remember? Oh gosh, I don't remember. I want, I want to say mid eighties, but it doesn't matter yeah. anyway. Um, and of course, I think I, I think uh, Ki uh, Hoi Kwan gives a, a like a really luminous performance. Um, I think the film didn't stick the landing narratively. Um, it felt pat for me at the end in a way that I actually think. It didn't need to in order for the film to you have mean because felt of like the sort of celebration of the family unit at the very end. Uh, yes, it felt very neat. It, it, yeah, fe- right. it felt as though for me it would have been, it would have had perhaps more integrity as a film if they had if, if things had not kind of gone so well for the family, right? Um, because that because, would have been a much better, better, but a much darker movie. <laughs> yes, but so much. So much of the film is about um, uh, sort of paths not taken, or yes. kind of, and and I think that to sort of at the, at the very end to kind of bring these narratives together in a way that doesn't have any residue, right? Like, th- yes, it felt it felt so pat. I me. agree with that. I mean, yeah. the funny thing about I was going to use that exact phrase to talk in a more meta way about the formal thing. Yeah, that like to me, this kind of filmmaking and calling back both to the to the action, the Chinese action cinema that we've both been talking about, and to this sort of like weird Noah Hawley show from the yeah again twenty teens, um, is like the path not taken mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. comic book adaptations. And I think you're right with this sort of maybe the ending is too pat or too perfect because it actually pulls against. Yeah. And again, this I think get, gets back to the way in which sort of uncritical engagement, even with a thing that you think is good, which is weird here, right? Right. Um, can blind you to what's going on because right. part of what's happening in this story is she is discovering, right, the Michelle Yeoh character in, in particular, that the non-superhero version of her, as including the version of, there's one of the universes in which she's just her, right? Yes. Right? She's just Michelle Yeoh, the actress, watching Michelle watching, Yeoh yes. play movies, which is very funny. Yes. Um, but is discovering that the best version of her is in fact the non-superpower version of right, her. Right, the one that makes all the other versions possible. And the thing that I think is least explored and could have been explored in that ending um, is that there's a, a strong undercurrent or a strong suggestion, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that in most of her other universes, she is also unhappily married. Uh, so what's his What's his actual name in the film, Quan? Waymond. Waymond. She's actually fairly consistently unhappily married to Wayman and has like a sort of sub erotic tension with Jamie Lee Curtis. Correct. I, I don't know that the film says enough. Oh, I felt like that was being like shouted from the Raptors and then it was sort of erased at the very, very end. Oh, sure. But I mean, I mean, I registered that, but I also think that the, it's so, uh, the, the film because the film doesn't do anything with it. I, I it just I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, the thing I was gonna say is like the path not taken there would have been the like successful unraveling of their family. Yes, yes, yes. Like yes, a yes. non like an unraveling of the family unit that was not tragic. Right. Um, right. But right. of course it doesn't. That, you know that's you know the form of criticism that's like that's not the story I would have told. It's also not what we want to maybe get at here. Um, so if you haven't seen this film, um, it is, and this is a very, very sort of um, sort of surface level synopsis, I suppose. Yeah. Um, uh, this is about a, um, a Chinese American family um, uh, which runs uh, a laundromat. Um, uh, Evelyn, um, played by Michelle Yeoh, her husband Wayman, and their daughter uh, Stephanie Shu, who plays. Stephanie. A character, and their daughter Joy, Joy played by right, played Joy. by this uh, played by Stephanie Shu. Um, the laundromat is being audited, um, so kind of the the beginning of the film sets up this kind of very stressful environment where, um, you know, they're bringing their receipts to um, an IRS inspector played by Jamie Lee Curtis, um, and in the course of doing this. Um, 
uh, uh, Michelle Yeoh's kind of reality begins to fragment, um, and um, she sees sort of um, a version of her husband from um, uh, uh, what he describes as um, the alpha verse. Um, and this version of her husband kind of explains to her that um, many parallel universes exist, and um, uh, there is a, a kind of an arch villain across these universes. Uh, Jobu Tupaki, played by uh, the daughter. Uh, right, which um, is just yeah, Stephanie right. Shu gone evil or something. I, yeah. Um, or uh, gone nihilist, more specific to the right, story. Right. I did find the bagel thing funny. Yes. I will admit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who has sort of um, created this kind of singularity type thing that is sort of uh, um, going to destroy this multiverse. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, um, Michelle Yeoh's character is kind of tasked with um, kind of jumping across these parallel universe right. versus to kind of find this this arch villain and and uh, and bring her down. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the, that's right. That's and the like, basics of the plot. <laughs> and like part of the visual logic of this film is um, that is very funny um, is that you know, the way in which one moves across universes is by doing the least predictable thing uh, uh, possible. Uh, and this often involves a lot of, again, calling back to those kind of like Jackie Chan style sort of action comedy films. Um, like doing the silliest possible thing, right. often quite gross or, or scatological or, or, uh, or both. Or, 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 um, or kind of uncomfortable to watch. So one of the early ones involves like, um, uh, Waymond kind of giving himself four paper cuts between yes, his that fingers. Really, that really, <laughs> that was in fact more brutal than the people shoving things up their asses one. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that just felt kind of juvenile. Well, I, I was going to say that a lot of the things that the film is clearly pulling on as well, like the scene where they fight, oh, there's a scene where Waymond fights with an American flag, which I thought is very funny. There's a scene where they duel with dildos. Uh, both of these things are taken straight out of, again, uh, the lexicon of recent video games actually so like those are both i think uh saints row 3 and saints row 4 uh, feature those things um so these are things that are sort of like out there in the universe and one of the things i think the film does well is bringing those things together yeah um and it embraces like the thing about that logic that i keep wanting to come to come back to is that logic really runs against like yes the sort of that you're gonna like the storytelling you get and i know it's funny because uh you, Izzy, have not watched a lot of Marvel movies. In fact, you have watched zero. I think I've seen two. Oh, you've seen two. All yeah. right. Which two do you know? Is Black Panther Marvel? That is, well, yes. Okay. Black Panther is Marvel. Black Panther, by the way, is a terrible movie. And the second yes. one is really bad, too. And the other one is? Reactionary, like deeply flawed movies. I'm, I'm not surprised. I haven't seen the second one, but I'm not surprised. The other one I've seen is the one involving a snap a snap? Oh, infi oh, Infinity War. Right. Uh, the Malthusian argument yeah. for population reduction. Yeah, those are the only ones. <laughs> Malthusian I've seen. argument for population reduction. The movie. But I mean, but I've, I've you know I've sort of seen enough clips to recognize yeah, yeah, yeah. what you're talking. I about. I actually remember yeah. showing a trailer for that in uh, the first version of my capitalism and desire class mm -hmm. and being like, who actually wanted this? <laughs> right. I mean, I think there's a lot to be said there. We're not going to, I think we're not going to go all culture industry like we did last time. Although we may have a few choice things to say in that universe. Um, but the thing I wanted to point out though, is that all the, Im the impulses in those movies, again, is to sort of round the edges out, give me a coherent, uh, traditional-ish storytelling object that can be sort of jibe with all this stuff. And in fact, where this movie uh, actually works its best is when it's yeah. like actually playing into absurdism, silliness, things that don't make sense yeah. in sort of not just like forget like quantum physics, whatever right. world, but even in the plain language of like things that like, don't have to have a kind of payoff or that are just, no, they have yeah. no payoff. In so fact, like, I think the, the, um, the, the styling and the outfits are like a really, a really oh, nice yeah. example of this because there are some beautiful costume work in this film that is sort of this kind of, this villain character is styled in very couture, like, 
um, sort of art as fashion oh, yes, style very much outfits. So. And there's nothing there's nothing about that they want to say beyond that. But it's a really like. It and doesn't, Michelle, it, Mich- I will say Michelle Yeoh is very believable as an immigrant mother. Yeah. She dresses exactly like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. From the sneakers to the like, I don't know, like some kind of like uh, the vest that she wears. It's the, like the cart. The, my grandma used yeah. that cart. I mean, it's just like it's they really did nail a few things really, really well in this yeah. film. And then a lot of the sort of. Um, artistry is really at odds with that like Thanos or Black Panther mm-hmm. style storytelling, right? Where it, it really is reaching for v- both sort of a really deep history of film mm-hmm. and also, uh, yeah, absurdism. Yep. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, and in both of those things, like I think, I mean, that's where kind of the film really shines. There's references as kind of as obscure as like, um, have you seen that film, Paprika? Oh, of course. Yeah. The, Satoshi Kon. Yeah. I love that movie. So, yeah. uh, I just watched a clip of Satoshi Kon talking for two minutes about how Darren Aronofsky has ripped off almost every one of his movies. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah, that's amazing. We need to link that. <laughs> um, but uh, the 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 scene um, where she's kind of attending the film, um, where she's yes. attending the film is... Oh, that's well, Paprika. You're totally yeah. right. Mm-hmm. How did I miss that? Yeah. Um, and so like... Uh, Paprika is an anime by Satoshi Kon for people. Know. They're <laughs> the real um, the real fondness they have for their craft. I think when yes. that shows in the movie yes. is so feels so genuine and loving to me that I think that's where the movie really shines. And yeah, in a, and in a way that like when I think of the new it, like the Disney family of of cinematic universes, what do you call that? Right, the Disney blob. The blob. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the equivalent of the foreign policy blob. Uh, yeah, which maybe will come up in today's episode, considering how much. Uh, China is now being demonized for everything. Um, but and it, it is to me an interesting like historical fact that this movie becomes popular at that moment um, that almost, again, is jarring, right? At a moment in which like uh, it has been almost continuous since the beginning of the Trump era, well through, through now, Biden has not changed this even remotely, that China is held up as this like horrible, like, entity that is out to destroy you and your life and is the cause of all the world's problems, um, which is totally, as someone who's like researched a fair amount of this stuff, is like, I'm not going to say the Chinese are the best on earth, but like that is a one-sided, not just a one-sided story, I mean it's a one-sided battle. Like they are desperate to be like, yo, like why are you guys doing this? We have to work together on like 90,000 things. Anyway, it's funny that this movie sort of comes up in that moment. Um, but no, the other blob, the Disney blob, um, Often, sort of, uh, you occasionally, I feel like, what's his name? A couple, there are a couple filmmakers who've managed to get sort of some. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not the biggest fan of even auteur theory uh, either, but like some sense of a of a unique cinematic tape in uh, the sort of Marvel properties or in the Star Wars properties. But in general, the gestalt of the production of those films is to erase and to make, and they're not the, there's something I feel like we actually haven't talked about on this show because we haven't haven't done Disney. uh, We haven't done Marvel is like, they're not the worst movies. In fact, they're not like, they're not gung ho enough to be terrible. I yeah, mean, yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah, no. they're very terrible. No, I've said, I've said, I think to you often, like, I really appreciate an interesting failure. Yeah, like, more than anything. they're not <laughs> David Lynch Dune, yeah. right? They're not like face planting for the sake of like some kind of like crazy goal. Um, instead, they sort of hover in this like mi- again. I hate to keep using like sort of brow theory, but this like vi- like middle browish thing where it is like just like spiffed up enough that it's not like a cavalcade of, of comedy. Mm-hmm. So it's not an early Jackie Chan movie, um, but it's also sort of dumbed down enough that it's not the uh, Noah Hawley adaptation of X-Men. Yeah. Instead, it's it's this sort of happy medium in which all the different filmmakers, all the actors are made to, as, as similar as humanly possible. Um, very ironic, in yeah. fact, for the way in which this film is being celebrated as an achievement of that, and yet it is not doing that at all. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And I think 
it's not doing it to an extent that, in my view, a lot of the kind of popular commentary doesn't even realize because of kind of the depth of its engagement with, with cinema history and because in general, because because of the public's sort of disinterest in that same Well, history. I don't know if it's the public or if it's like these very vocal parts of, let's say, fandom. Sure, or sure, like sure, that, sure, sure, sure. Right? Yeah. So like part of what, you know, was the inspiration for this episode is that meme, um, which I was shocked to discover in researching for this episode, actually has an origin, right? There is this like cartoon this, meme. The, the let people enjoy things meme. Yeah. yeah, it's the let people enjoy things meme and, it's the pers- and the sort of cartoon character, one of them is pinching the other one's lips and it's like, shh, let people enjoy things. And uh, whenever I saw that on the internet, um, I always thought of the p- famous picture of Adorno with his, uh, with his thumb pointing down. Yep. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. like, no, no man, no. There is no critical or like there is no justification whatsoever um, for this idea of like just let people enjoy things. Um, it is like a, a a patently sort of anti. It's both anti-critical. It's anti-intellectual. It's often anti-historical. It often also involves a fundamental misunderstanding yes. or a misplacement um, uh, between the self and the representation, uh, let's say, on the screen. But it could be in, in, it yes. could be in music, it could be in other art forms as well. But it, I think it's particularly powerful in cinema and in television. Yes. Um, and so I was shocked, literally shocked, to discover that this meme has an origin. Um, wait, I'm going to pull it up right now. Yeah. Um, so this is an actual comic drawn by the cartoonist Adam Ellis, and it was in. I think like he think he just posted it to his Facebook. I don't think it was even part of like a, like a series or something like this. And it was literally. I I cannot believe you can like stick a timestamp. Can, like, can I see it? Again? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's February third, twenty sixteen. Because of course it's Facebook, so you actually know the exact time and date that this meme was born. Um, and, uh, right. It's a multiple panel, uh, comic and it's actually not about movies. It's, uh, nominally about, uh, football or it's a sports ball here. Um, right. And so this sort of like, I guess character meant to be some kind of like elitist scum is, is being like, Oh, you're watching some sports ball. How's the stupid spot? And then the other person pinches their lips and says, shh, let people enjoy things. And I think there's so much embodied. Sorry, go ahead, Izzy. There are so many kind of ways to unpack this phrase, right? So like before we kind of even get into the fact that sort of the sort of what is the task of criticism bit, um, sort of at a very general level, people are more able to enjoy things now than they've ever been before. And it's striking (laughs) to me that like when people say let people enjoy things, what it often seems to me to reflect is like, no, we're let you're you're permitted to enjoy things. It sounds like you're not letting yourself enjoy the fact that other people don't enjoy things. Um, like it reflects a kind of anxiety about um, loving cultural objects that are objects of critique. Right, and that um, if you don't, if it's very funny because many things I like, I know other people do not. But it's like as if that uh, if I have. Even a mod, it's very, again, to me, it's very funny to be doing this with everywhere, everything, everywhere, all at once, which is not a bad movie. Right. It's not even a bad movie. It's actually a pretty good movie. Um, I think it fails in the, some of the ways that Izzy and I were just talking about. Um, but otherwise, I would say this is like a, pr- by the standards of Hollywood, which is a pretty low standard, uh, this floor. is a pretty good movie. Yes. Um, but one of the things that let people enjoy things as a concept sort of gets in the way of is even uh, a critical engagement with something that's pretty good. And yes. when I was doing research for this, I came across uh, that, and again, not only is there like a start date to this meme, which blows my fucking mind, um, but that um, Kate Wagner had written a piece in The Baffler in about 2019 on this meme uh, and uh, in the very appropriately named article, don't let people enjoy things. Yeah. Um, and 
Kate Wagner, for people who don't know, is a great um, architect architecture critic. And, and art critic. Um, uh, famous, probably most famous for her, I think now it's on and off, but used to be pretty regular, uh, blog, McMansion Hell, in which she would just go through sort of architectural monstrosities, particularly um, uh, uh, examples of sort of excess in American domestic uh, architecture suburban suburban yeah. yeah sort of sort of like all these sprawl things and actually it's really funny I've been reading some of her more recent stuff um, in re there's this been this wave of sort of like idiot urbanism yes. I don't know how to call it um, uh, and uh, one of the parts of contemporary idiot urbanism uh, as pushed by people like uh, just you know bona fide geniuses like Matthew Iglesias uh people you know who like you know the really into things like I don't know famously wonderful things like the Iraq war um saying oh we should allow uh you know we should uh, zone for these single occupancy apartments this is our mayor here in New York is a big fan of this he's also a great wonderful human being who I have nothing negative to say about that is all lies uh he's an atrocious human being who I think most recently came out against the separation of church and state that's right he's yeah. a cha chaotic club promoter yeah he's uh, like a, yeah he's got vibes man <laughs> I will say this but him, him versus de Blasio and he, he does make de Blasio look, it's like the classic joke about, um, about New York mayors. You're like, miss me yet? Yeah. And I'm like, ah, kind of, I guess. Uh, we're bringing tenements back now. Yeah, no, because he, <laughs> he's just got wacky vibes. But anyway, one of the things he brought up was this idea of like, well, so, like, like, oh, let's have these single occupancy apartments that don't have windows. Then we could convert commercial real estate into residential real estate. And I was actually reading Kate uh, Wagner recently on this where she's just like, sunlight is not a luxury amenity. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like if we're about to commodify the fucking sun, like that's it. Pack it up, folks. Like it's all done. And in fact, the whole purpose of architecture and design is solving problems like that is like how can i do um max zoning and things like this without denying people actually a decent quality of life including the, access the to fucking lights. sun so anyway uh i i re bring this all up as a long about way that she actually lists four aspects of let people enjoy oh, things okay. in this article i think it's really helpful so she calls it a fourfold confession right so uh it takes a one of four forms. Form the first, I do not want to feel judged for my consumption choices, right? Yes. Form the second, I want to silence people who disagree with me about this particular piece of media by making them feel like they are cheerless or judgmental. Yep. And this cheerless thing is sort of particularly prominent in the... The reaction yeah, no to one has yeah. fun. I mean, or I mean, so the film that was often kind of um, counterpost to this one um, in in the discourse was Tar, and yes. the accusation is always that Tar is um, people like Tar because they think that joyless films make them better thinkers. Right? But Tar is a comedy. It is a top. We it talked is a about this in our. Talked about I mean, this. I've actually sent people there's because there's been like a renewed Tar discourse. Yes, I've sent people our end of year thing and being like, look, it's only like twenty minutes of this like three hour marathon episode <laughs> but like the tar discussion it's like tar is a comedy it is like a comedy in fact i actually don't think these movies are that like in many ways distinct i do think actually tar is a better movie but um but like it's not in fact i mean it's not like sending someone stalker Right, it's not like sending someone Andre Rublev. Not to say on Tarkovsky. I'm trying to think what else is like aggressively weird, like high art cinema. Bergman, like it's not sending. It's not sending someone a uh, Vertov. Yeah. Right. It's not doing any of these things. Right. It's not even the like the high point of American sort of commercial cinema. Like all those like the Parallax View and shit like that from the 70s. It's not even that. Right. Yeah. Like it is in fact itself a kind a comedy and a satire right. drawing on genre elements including horror yeah. and psychological thrillers and things like this. I so, mean, I mean, part of it is that sort of this like. Um, uh, sort of diminished sense of the word cheerlessness, right? Like the, the idea that um, uh, for something to be um, uh, like 
tar, tar is accused of um, cheerlessness because it is, doesn't kind of conform to a particular idea of feel good. Right. Well, right. And in fact, um, as we were just noting, this movie is best when it's not yeah. playing off that feel good. Yeah. I mean, there really are roads not taken in everything yes. ever all at once. And it's not just that sort of like sexual undertone stuff I talked about before, although I felt very strong that that was there. Maybe I, maybe no, I'm no, no, I think, I think you're, I think you're right. Especially because it's very much in parallel with the daughter, right? The right. daughter is breaking out of the sort of ideal type of the American, the immigrant story in yep. America, uh, partially by her queer identity. And, it's like, I feel like heavily intimated that the mother too wants to break out in this way. Yeah. But she then is entrapped. Yeah. It's like very actually kind of horrifying when you think of it. She's sort of re-trapped or drawn back in. Into the heteronormative the, the family. The heteronormative family. Okay, so what are three and four? Oh, sorry, yes, three and four. Um, three, I recognize an aspect of this piece of media that is worthy of criticism, and I am defensive of yeah. this. Yeah, okay, good. And number four, I do not want to think critically about the things I consume. And if I absorb any criticism about the things I consume, it will magically ruin my enjoyment yeah. of them. Them. Can I add a fifth one? Absolutely. Which is that um, uh, critical engagement uh, isn't itself a pleasure. Right. Um, oh, that's like part of the joy to me, not just of, of engaging with media, but of, it is also the joy of talking and, and yeah. of writing and of thinking yeah. about media. Absolutely. And like that does not trade back. In fact, we've talked many times on this show and on, on and on the other shows about how some of the most problematic media that we do, media here being used in the broadest sense, right, um, that we do enjoy, um, like having to engage with its problematic natures, yeah. having to engage with the things that it is clearly, I mean, I just did it with this like a dragon thing, right? right. It is a nationalist text. So I have to engage with my enjoyment of a nationalist text, not as like some kind of like horrifying self-criticism se se right. session, but also like, oh, this is the way nationalism works. Right. Like, because and, it's working on you. And, all, and it, I'm going to sound like such a Spinozan, which I kind of am, but like, right, that activity, that like gears turning in my mind, that's a pleasurable experience. Right. The seduction is, or I mean, you and Rebecca have talked about kind of Wagner at length, but like yeah. the seduction is the point, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you have to deal with seduction. Yeah. So like if you, for example, so now moving away from, from, from Kate's piece now, right? If this is like, if in fact one wants, like your favorite, I don't know, your favorite movie is... Or something that is it's just Avengers, right? Or some, <laughs> right, right, sure, yeah, sure, whatever. That's your favorite movie. Uh, I think you, I think you should maybe watch some more movies. But sure, whatever, yeah. um, right? Uh, <laughs> there are a bunch of others. By the way, that's our new, uh, that's our new pr uh, producer and engineer, Elliot, la laughing in the background there. Uh, <laughs> say hello to everyone. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, right? Let's say Avengers is your favorite movie. Um, part of the joy, it's not necessarily like always, it doesn't have to be sparring, although it could, it be, could sparring. be And sometimes it could be just the joy of hate watching something you love, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that too. I mean, like, I will go, like, I have done it. In fact, go find our episode from the music criticism series on fish. I have laid out in like <laughs> three hour detail why I think this thing that most uh, cultural critics think is absolute trash is actually pretty good. And it is fun for me that that friction exists in the world. Yeah. It is interesting and enjoyable to engage with this. And it does not detract. In fact, I would go so far as to say it enhances yes. my experience of listening to that music yes. or going to that concert to have in my mind these critical ideas. Yes. Like, oh, the lyrics are bad. Oh, the music doesn't go anywhere. Oh, it doesn't do this. Oh, it doesn't do that. I actually helps me refine yes. and think about why I like this thing. Yes. Or why or why you like films in general. Yeah. Right? Or, or why I like music or films in general. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean and and 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's just, it's never occurred to me. So I think, I think often, um, you know, when I'm thinking about these sorts of issues of like, so a film that is very, very close to my heart because it's my mom's favorite and because I grew up watching it is The Sound of Music. The Sound of Music <laughs> is a terrible historical yeah, film. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty rough. Some of the numbers are not bangers. They go on forever. But I will always love this movie and I will always love hating on this movie. So like coming back to this though, like I think part of the thing that's really interesting about like, I've encountered this not only in cinema, but especially as someone who's really, as you know, I talk about it all the time, really into games. There was this long period of time. Have I talked about this on the show? My like two invites to like gaming conventions to talk about games aesthetics. Okay, so there's a long period of time where like part of the gaming community, whatever you want to call it, was obsessed with getting people to take games seriously as an art form. Right, and the same thing happened in film history. Right, same thing happened in television history, uh, popular music, et cetera, et cetera. You can do, you can go back. But like part of, and in fact, you know, one of the, I got invited to a few of these uh, sort of like convention style things, like not like academic conferences, but like pop con and and sort of presented in aesthetic terms, like why I thought this was a justifiable argument. People loved that. People loved that. Then I got invited back and was like, so therefore. If we accept premise one, premise two is we have to talk about all the shit that's super fucked up and that is like, right, we have to actually engage with these now, right? If it is, in fact, art, that the way cinema is art, the way that paintings are art, the way that music yeah. compositions are art, I must therefore bring those tools to bear, not just to valorize an object, but to subject it to the scrutiny that uh, uh, cultural consumption demands. And uh, I hate to sort of always ground it. It is the 100th anniversary of the Frankfurt School. So if we bang on about the Frankfurt School, that is justified this year. Did you see that great interview in Verso with the current no. head of the Frankfurt School? Um, it's very, there's this very funny segment. The interviewer is like, you know, when the Frankfurt School was founded in, in 1931, its tasks were da-da-da-da-da. What are the tasks of the Frankfurt School today? And the answer was just exactly this. I did see, I did see that. I think it's also funny, though, because that's actually not true. Right, it's <laughs> not strictly the case. Yeah, uh, but that's a topic for another day. I mean, one of the reasons why those guys were so hepped up, if you're thinking about those classic sort of debates between people like Theodore Adorno and Walter or Benjamin were so hepped up on, on like reading pop culture. And by the way, even Adorno, so famous for being sort of this like, what do you call it? Wet blanket or whatever, um, uh, right? Is also in there, like in the most famous thing. I don't remember if we talked about this last time or not, like in the culture industry, but also in some of his later stuff. He's like in there writing serious like commentary on Betty Boop. Yeah. And Donald Duck and Greta Garbo, right? Yeah. Like, like he's watching the pop movies. You might like them, but like he's engaging with them. Yes. Why? Because for them, this was like, this is the stuff that makes up our consciousness, right? These are the symbols and the stories that give like, right? If the if the if there is a missing piece in the sort of social theoretical puzzle, which again, this is launched in a really serious historical manner, right? This is like the if there is like an animating question to this kind of cultural analysis in the Marxist universe, the animating question is why did the Second International break towards nationalism as opposed to towards world revolution, even when world revolution was in the cards at the, uh, at, with the launch of the Russian Revolution? Um, and there are many ways to answer that. You can answer that geopolitically. You can answer that about economics. You can answer that about colonialism and imperialism. But one of the ways to answer that is, well, what were the sticky aspects of culture? Mm -hmm. What made up, what were the stories people were telling? What were the, the, what was the role of the family and ideology of the family? What were the role of these things? And it's like, yes, it can seem like, you know, talking about like Jackie Chan in Police Story 3 or like whatever can seem like very immaterial to a serious discussion. But in fact, the seriousness is because the, of the way that those casual things do populate our minds. And I, it, it's very funny because um, I know I'm a little bit of a ramble right now, so I apologize and I'll hand it back over. But like I have seen actually so much in recent days, uh, both because there has been, as we're talking, it's uh, March 22nd. There's sort of a lot of global financial turmoil and a lot of geopolitical turmoil. Um, and I have seen the number of times I have seen uh, uh, 
the sort of critical reference to a kind of thinking shaped by Marvel movies in the context yeah. of my non-cultural reading. I read very much more frequently stuff on like the workings of the financial system, on climate and politics, on geopolitics, things like that, and have seen an explosion yep. of people being like, yo, you really got to get your head out of that like heroes and villains space of like Marvel comics. So it, like, it's a really good translation to this moment, which by the way, does not mean ignore those movies. It means yes. lean in, uh, no, no joke for <laughs> Sal Sandberg, whatever. But right, it means like lean into a critical engagement with them. Why do you love them? What is interesting about yes. them? What makes one of them better than another? Yes. Right. If we don't, uh, if we just enjoy things, do I think Ant-Man, what is it, three that just came out? Right, Ant Man three is that as good as Thor two or Avengers what seventeen or whatever, right? Yeah. Like I don't even have if I if I were to follow the logic of uh, let people enjoy things, I wouldn't even be able to parse my own objects. Yes, and it's striking to me that this discourse is happening with this degree of intensity among a group of pe people who I suspect are also quite concerned about um, this attempt kind of across the United States to sort of um, to, to close or kind of diminish the influence of like critical department, like departments yes, informed it is by critical wild. theory. Often, because often I think that pe there is a lot of good intentions. Yeah. Like, <laughs> although sometimes it comes across queasy. I will say, for example, for this film. Um, uh, Ki Hoi Kwan. Ki Hoi Kwan. Um, who uh, famously was uh, in Indiana Jones 2, Indiana Jones Temple of Doom, and which Goonies. is a, and Goonies, and he played extremely racialized characters. Um, Indiana Jones 2, by the way, is one, one of, of the, the worst most racist films, films and, and, and it's not bad because it is racist. It is bad in addition to being right. racist. Yes, it's just, it's <laughs> excruciating before the most racist parts begin. Yeah, yeah, unbelievably so. But there has been a sort of, I would say, I think there's a lot of like, it's funny that you note this, like, like I think you're thinking of like the Florida stuff, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. These sort of like, and it's not just in Florida. Many places are sort of banning any kind of discourse that involves essentially what we were just talking about, right? That can be traced to critical theory, but it's not even that. It's yeah. not these people read Adorno. Um, it's more like like anything that's even remotely non-normative, yeah. right? So, I mean, there's not really a lot of straight lines between critical theory, for example, and, I don't know, queer theory or critical race theory. There are some, but like, uh, if you're like someone who really does that stuff, you know critical race theory is mostly a, uh, developed in the legal world, and queer theory mostly develops in the sort of post-feminist world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that these aren't just like some kind of massive building block of the thing that we jokingly call this series of cultural Marxism. Yep. Um, sorry, I just turned myself around. Oh, th I was saying, I, th I think, so. At, right, you were saying that there's this rise of this sort of attack on this, mostly from the right. Yes. And I actually would say, I think that the most of the fandoms we are dealing with here, I think would identify as some kind of like progressive liberal, yeah, yeah. right? It's almost in the Hegelian sense. And in fact, part of that often involves, and I think this is what's very frustrating, erasing things that happened in the past to make the just so story of progress work. Yeah. So it's like, oh, this is the first time that like Asians are being celebrated in American cinema. It's like, no, that's not true. Right. <laughs> like this is the, um, and in particular with Ki Hui Kwan, um, has been some of the discourse about him has been creepy where it's like oh he's so cute he's so charming it's such a vindication yep. and on one hand it is a vindication i'm glad they reached out and like gave him you know uh, he's very good in this movie um but it's also like uh, he the phrase the words being used around his performance are in fact infantilizing are, infantilizing toward all the actors because it suggests that there's something in this victory that is so fragile and tenuous that people being even ambivalent right. about this it's like it's gonna fall off right. a cliff right and i think that's part of the anxiety both that like kate was getting at in that piece 
at, uh, but that we're getting at more generally with the sort of broader definition, there's like this anxiety. It's like so funny because these are like, this film is not in, I, I don't know who owns this. Universal Pictures is not it, a It's small. an A24 yeah. film. So, right. So it's like the biggest source of art house cinemas or is that Annapurna still? I'm not sure. Right. So it's like on the cusp of mainstream. It's distributed by Universal. And That's pretty big. They clearly spent a bajillion dollars because even the cast alone would have cost that. Um, and to be clear, right, there is some material basis for this kind of defensiveness insofar as these kinds of award shows are often um, like strong indicators of the kind of films that get funding, the kind of actors that get cast, yes. all of this sort of stuff. And in that sense, I, I understand that there is a sort of um, part of the protectiveness people feel does come from a, a, pl- a real place. That's right. Um, but the, I mean, the, to, to give you a, an idea of kind of how intense the critic, the, the sort of, the, um, how vocal or how, how toxic, I suppose, the defensiveness has been, one of the directors had to kind of step in when he saw some of this happening online oh, really? and tell people to cool it. But in the sense of what? Oh, so this was, this was back in December when um, A.O. Scott kind of had his list of best films of 2022. Um, and, you know, this started to circulate on Twitter and um, the film's fan base, um, you know, um, started to tweet things like um, uh uh, like fire your fire your film critic. The fact that everything everywhere all at once is on isn't on this list is like oh, an wow. affront. Da 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 da. And the Daniel Kwan, the director, like had to publicly retweet some of this and be like, "You you all need to please tone it down." Um, yeah, yeah, I mean. It's funny you bring up A.O. Scott because he just recently announced that uh, yeah. he is leaving film criticism and he gave a bunch of reasons for this. And one of the things uh, he said, uh, and this is from an article dated, uh, oh God, March 17th. So just last week. Um, and you know, it's sort of like a rambling interview kind of piece. Um, you know, he says, it's inevitable that movies sometimes abuse their power and mistreat the people who love them most. When my kids were little, they were regular companions on Saturday morning preview screenings. I often objected, uh, objected to the pandering cynicism of family-friendly movies like The Lorax and Despicable Me. I also marveled at the artistry of Studio Ghibli and the sublime ingenuity, or ingenuity of Pixar and its glory years. I would disagree if Pixar ever had glory years. I don't think so. But anyway, he says, similarly, I was pleased with the first couple of Spider-Man pictures, impressed by Batman Begins and The Dark Knight, which my brilliant colleague and fellow cr- critic of Mahola Dargis reviewed, and I admired the way George Lucas connected the mythic docs in Revenge of the Sith. But I'm not a fan of modern fandom. This isn't only because I've been swarmed on Twitter by angry devotees of Marvel and DC, and more recently Top Gun Maverick and Everything Everywhere All at Once. It's more the behavior uh, that represents a kind of anti-democratic, anti-intellectual mindset that is harmful to the cause of art and antithetical to the spirit of movies. I will notice that I, happily, he happily avoids, and he's smart enough. If people forget he's Joan Scott's kid. He's smart enough not to do the Wait, cancel culture. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. He is Joan Scott, the, the Marxist yeah. economist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, if you ever read his review for Mad Max Fury Road, which we'll come back to maybe. That's it, okay. Um, when we talk about Academy Award winners that weren't, um, it has uh, a lot of, so you're, you're like, wait, what? Why is this quoting like Marx left and right? It's, that makes that's sense. One. Um, it's more the beha- sorry, uh, anti-democratic, anti-intellectual mindset that is harmful to the cause of, of art and anteth- antithetical to the spirit of movies. And I was going to say, I really credit him for not doing the cancel culture thing because, in fact, he's he's saying something different here than that sort of pat right wing narrative. Uh, that's also become a kind of centrist narrative. He says, fan culture is rooted in conformity, obedience, group identity, and mob behavior. And its rise mirrors and models the spread of intolerant, authoritarian, and aggressive tendencies in our politics and communal life. And I think, go ahead. I mean, I don't love, A.S. Scott's not always right. But there's something power, there is something going on here. I think there's something going on. I'm always, I'm always worry about um, talking about a sort of um, 
I, it's I, like I you're think, gonna slip into a rentian totalitarianism where like everything i also is, think yeah. right like the the again like the principal cause of these kind of when you think about kind of like anti-democratic tendencies in art, like I want first and foremost to think about the blob, right? Like if there are anti-democratic tendencies in art, it's because art, yeah, like good, that's art, right. good art is if being funded being and, a better... and good criticism isn't being funded. And right. good, like good uh, film journalism isn't being funded. And also like often these fan bases are like young kids. I mean, sometimes? I... Sometimes, I mean, less so with kind of, I think, Marvel, but like some... <laughs> Marvel. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's cute. In my mind, it's the There is, I think, a character Mar-Vell. in the Marvel universe called Marvel, which is why I'm laughing. Oh. Anyway, um, anyway. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, right? Like, he is, there's a little bit of a broken arrow here that's pointed at the fandom as opposed to at the consolidation yeah. and production. Yeah. Uh, and it is fascinating to note that, um, you know, both of the sort of, again, the classic texts I think of as Benjamin's work of art essay uh, and Adorno and Horkheimer's culture industry essay, which take different positions on mass culture and, yeah. and technological art, um, begin with extremely strong grounding statements in the productive, yeah. uh, the production process. Right. And part of what's interesting to me about like, especially everything all, everywhere all at once and it, it being crowned as an Academy winner is that it is being now like their work, which I guess is winning. I can't like, I can't uh, begrudge them for wanting the fucking paycheck. Right. I forgot who actually said that recently. There was a wonderful actress. Who, so they're like, why did you choose to play? I don't know, like Wonder Woman's sixth sister. And did you have like, cause the pay Cause was good. <laughs> like, like she didn't, she wasn't like, oh, it's a hearkening back to, you know, Euripides or something. You know, she was like, nah, the fucking pay is killer. <laughs> like, um, and there's also a very funny story about uh, Ian McClellan on the set of, oh, what was it? The one of the Hobbit films where he was literally just with green screen and he like, he almost had a nervous breakdown because he had no one to talk yep. to. Um, but like, there is also, I think, an element of truth in what um, Scott is saying here. Especially now that it's already, now that it's won. Right. Well, yes, it's now that it's one, and it's also that without the critical discourse and without the space for the critical discourse, there's not the space to be like, what does it mean yeah. when the more interesting film, which I would say everything ever all at once is, versus say, I don't know, Black Panther, what's the new one called? It's called Wakanda Forever, right? Or um, Avengers Endgame, or like, right? The thing that is actually more interesting as a piece of art is now being economically yeah. eaten by the larger beast. Yeah. And we see this all the time also with like platform capitalism more broadly. Um, so like Netflix, for example, some people will be like, oh my God, look, you look at all these wonderful like Korean dramas and Chinese dramas and Turkish uh, cinema and dramas and Indian stuff. And I'm in the back of my head knowing how the economics work. Right. I'm like, once Netflix has eaten that stuff, it's in the Netflix universe. Yep. And in fact, the, the production process, even in these places, you're like, oh my God, India is so far away, Turkey is so far away, start becoming enmeshed within yep. the logic of the way Netflix produces television yeah. and cinema. Yeah, and the 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 objects that are produced begin to follow, just um, just kind of recapitulate That's in right. an uncritical way this kind of template. Right, that- and it's actually a way in which national, uh, and again, this is problematic in its own way, right? Like a lot of, uh, a lot of countries that have nurtured successfully mm-hmm. good national cinema, and here I would talk about places like France, I would talk about places like Japan, I would talk about, I would talk about places like China. India is a kind of funny case because Indian movies are just so different than Western movies, um, but have usually, A, had strong state support, for their industries and strong prohibitions on how much exposure their domestic industries yep. have to Hollywood. Yeah. 
Um, bec why? Because if you want a strong national cinema, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, or Iran, Iran is another. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Iran. Iran yeah. is. I actually wrote my undergraduate thesis on that. Um, right, Iran under the revolutionary government sets up a lot of protections and incentives for filmmaking, in addition to a whole bunch of restrictions. Yeah. But it is in fact that sort of like protectionism, which is has a very ugly uh, connotation today, which allows the burgeoning yeah. of Iranian new wave. Yep. Uh, which eventually becomes like a, a, a place of great political and social criticism against the clerical regime. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, that was also a long. <laughs> no, I think that I think that's that's all right. This is a life free from destiny. Not only what we sow, not only what we show. The other part of this that I know we wanted to talk about is also, I think, there, it, this does tie so strongly into the idea of the Academy Awards or of the best picture as like signifying something. Like, yes. like do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I do. So I'm really, uh, I've been, the Oscars are an industry event, but the way we talk about them, and despite kind of years of kind of consecutive, like mind-bogglingly ba bad films being nominated or winning, we still speak about the Oscars as if it's like a referendum on aesthetic merit. Right, as if it like reflects something about like a critical appraisal that we can be like, ah, yes, that's, that's criticism realized. I mean, I have our friends at Teen Vogue to thank, the always intrepid editors. Uh, this is from an article on March 10th by Sophie Hasen. Um, uh, and I actually didn't know this history. I knew some of it. I knew about the strike breaking and stuff like this. I did not know that the Academy itself was formed by Louis Meyer himself of Metro Goldwyn mm -hmm. Meyer fame in 1927 in response. And we've talked about this in the past on the show to IATSE's very, very um, stringent and militant attempts to get, in fact, what they succeeded in getting, which yep. is strong uh, workplace protections and residuals to uh, profit it off of um what uh, of off the receipts of successful movies and meyer created the academy basically as a almost like a uh, a company union that was supposed to sort of smooth over the yeah. problems and bring recognition to everyone from the sort of lowest technician to the like you know to the producer director actor etc yeah. etc um and like the history like there's a long history, you can read about it, it's fascinating. Um, but the idea of the Oscar, I think this plays more into maybe that fan culture thing, or like, right, it's like a, 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 a symbol of legitimation. Like, yeah, 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 exactly. Like, if, like, uh, Izzy and I were doing this earlier, like, you can go pretty far back in the Oscars, um, <laughs> and there's like, a, you can, it's never been a great, like let's say uh guide to even just american cinema yeah. let alone world cinema um, but it has never been worse than a period which started in 1994 with forrest gump yes and ran as follows for best picture forrest gump braveheart the english patient titanic shakespeare in love Oof. and shakespeare in love is really where aggressive um oscar campaigning began um american beauty gladiator a beautiful mind chicago and then Oof. the Lord of the Rings. You're right. And then the Million Dollar Lord Baby, and then Crash. I mean, it goes on. And then on. it goes on. <laughs> I mean, because you can find real... You can find real losers in the previous... Uh, the most famous, I think, is... Uh, is uh, Oh God! Raging I'm, Bull. No, I would say the most famous is um, when How Green Is My Valley beat um, 
Citizen Kane. Oh, That's the yeah, one people yeah, yeah, often yeah. point to. Um, but, you know, we've talked before on the, like, about the almost like seeming impossibility of something like The Last Emperor winning in 1987, right? Again, this like very, uh, uh, again, a non, a piece of non uh, uh, American cinema winning, um, a piece that's fairly radical. And if I look before that, I get m- m- up fair share of decent movies. Platoon is the year before that. That's a pretty good movie. I'm Out of Deus. Africa is not, but I'm a Deus 94. Often when I think of, when I think of like the Oscar movie, it shows my age so bad. I think of things like Amadeus. I think of things like The Last Emperor. I think of things like Terms of Endearment that's on here, right? I think of things like all these kinds of like, those used to be Oscar bait. And then what Izzy is talking about, beginning with Forrest Gump and Jesus fucking Christ, like that movie. Oh my God, that movie is. F- talk about There's erasing boomer history. propaganda. Like, oh yeah. my God. Uh, also, that was the same year. I remember it just so vividly. It actually like it made a note in my mind because that year I was I was what fourteen, and. Uh, I had seen most of the movies. Oh, that, that was were the pulp, that was the Pulp Fiction yeah. year. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, clearly the best movie of these movies is Pulp Fiction, like without question. And in fact, if you're if you're doing like a for good or for bad, and I think you can make both cases, like films that have left their mark on American cinema, uh, Pulp Fiction much more so in many ways than Forrest Gump. Yeah. Uh, oh, I guess the gestalt of the two gives you. <laughs> something avatar um but right there's a real switch as izzy noted in this period and it also coincides with this bizarre thing which for the first i don't know what 70 years of this thing's existence it was always five movies and then starting the year i believe 2009 is it 2009 yeah Yeah. so in that the year of the hurt locker Another yeah. Film so one. I mean, 2008 is Slumdog Millionaire, which is atrocious. Atro- I mean, a lot of these movies are the idea of this as like a, as like an artistic achievement. Jesus Christ, 2005 Crash. This movie is so fucking terrible. And if you're looking at the other movies that were up, they're not all great. But one of them is Brokeback Mountain. Is actually a good movie, and like. Just like the idea that this is some kind of like aesthetic contest. The like, fact that this year, it will. The fact that in 2019, uh, Jojo Rabbit was nominated, and the fact that this past year, Avatar: The Way of Water, famous oh from God. our last episode, oh was also my nominated. God. Yeah. So I could not believe. So like, yeah. Starting in this period, not only do you get an expansion of the number of films, but um, they start to take on, uh, and I use this word lightly because I feel like sometimes people overdo it. Uh, let's call it a poptimist uh, vibe. Although honestly, these always have had it. Now that I'm looking at the list, it's been there for a long time. But like, it is wild to look back at something like that 2009 year, right? And you, and the Hurt Locker wins. I don't know, Catherine Bigelow is one of the most jingoistic nationalist directors, right? Like, yep. like just like of all time. And she got a lot of praise that year because people were like, hell yeah, Catherine Bigelow like beat her ex-husband for. Oh, really? Who was her ex-husband? Jim Cameron. Oh, that's funny. I didn't wait. I didn't know they were. A yeah. Thing. That's, that's too much for my brain to think about right now. Um, in that year though, it's funny. Some of the better movies so uh, Izzy and I, again, we're going over this list before. District 9 is a science fiction film by Peter Jackson uh, and Carolyn Cunningham. Um, pretty good, actually. Yeah. Right? Um, I, thought an, educa- I thought an Education was also An Education is a good, good movie. Uh, a Serious Man is one of the yeah. Coen Brothers' better movies. It's really quite good. I'm, I'm happy to see it up there. But actually, there's a bunch of schlock here. Yeah. And the thing that... So Avatar... Um, up and uh, I, up in the air is that one with the up is the cartoon right and up in the air is the film about the guy on the airplane yeah like these are not good movies <laughs> like these are these were just movies these that were year. just <laughs> movies that came out with famous people in them and like it goes on it gets like even more I insane mean, you begin to see as a, you know i just mentioned this kind of like this switch with shakespeare and love to like that was so this was the year that like weinstein aggressively promotes this movie yes that's right um and starts like oscars campaigning as a real big money 
like thing. Um, and you can see in the subsequent years, just the way you, when you look at the list, you're like, oh, that's a movie that was whose Oscar campaign was just really well funded. Yeah. And I will also say that it's in this period. I feel like, look, this is part of the point of bringing up the origin story of, of the Academy is that this is a right wing institution. Yeah. It's a conservative institution. The idea that it like reflects some kind of like pure aesthetic, like power or judgment is insane. Um, to a degree that is to, to, to a greater degree than, other kind of film awards, which in, in part because of the way that the voting body oh, like, of the Academy it, is structured. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to say a little about, like compare it to BFI, for example? So I don't know what the voting structure of the, uh, BFI is, um, but I do know that, that the Academy is basically a sort of um, kind of industry, like, I don't know how many, fifth, fifth, some thousand plus number of industry players, actors. Um, um, it's basically a kind of popularity contest within the industry. Yeah. I was actually trying to look up what the BFI structure is, and I can't find it. But yes, it is a popularity contest. If you you can actually get access, I think, to some of the documents, often with the names removed, and sometimes people will share their own. But it is very funny because sometimes people you, are you're just like, like, "Oh, I voted for my friend whose movie I've seen." Yeah, or or whose movie I haven't seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, because it'll be some like fucking producer who's like 97 years old. Like, I haven't made a movie since 1972, but I guess that guy's all right. So I voted for that. So so I voted for Clint Eastwood's movie. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I heard of him. Like, it's it's just a kind of absurdism. But the other thing I would note about it is that I think in recent years it has actually become more reactionary. Yeah. Um, if I look at that 2009 win for The Hurt Locker, or the 2012 win for Argo, a film that I think knew, like people might remember this, this was a, a deeply anti-Iranian film made by Ben, ben Affleck. Affleck. Um, or it starred Ben Affleck? No, he was one of I mean, the directors he, yeah, he too. Was, oh, and George Clooney, Jesus Christ. Um, like really start reflecting an extremely conservative and very nationalist image yeah. of, uh, of uh, into American culture that's always been there, of course. Um, and there are a couple things that break through, don't get me wrong. Like I look at 2016 with something like Moonlight, like that's a great movie. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of the movies on here I think are pretty good movies. Arrival is a good movie. Hidden Figures, I actually know the person whose book that uh, that was based on it, but it's all right. It's it's okay by this sort of costume drama thing. But like it's that becomes the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Right? And if we get up to like, you know, again, 2019, Parasite, that's a great movie. But like I I was shocked when Izzy was showing me these lists before because yeah, they nominated Todd Phillips Joker. I mean, that was all what? right as like a character study or something. It wasn't like the worst movie ever. It wasn't the worst comic book movie ever, certainly. But best picture? Like, what the hell? Um, and this, the sort of fetishization of this as some kind of achievement. Yep. The things that everything, everywhere, all at once was up against this year are the new adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front, which I did not see. Did you see that? No. Yeah. Uh, Avatar, The Way of Water, which everyone has heard us talk about plenty. The Banshees of Isherine, which I know you enjoy. I did enjoy it. And I have not seen. It's good. I think I'm looking like forward it. to seeing it. Um, Elvis, which I got through about 20 minutes of and was like, this is one of the worst pieces of the cinema worst, I have ever touched. The worst film Tom Hanks has ever par- participated I'm in. I'm sorry. By, t- oh, 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 it's just, it's extremely. It's so bad. It's, <laughs> it's so I don't even I don't even know if I can describe to you how bad it is. It's it's shocking that he's that it's shocking. Um, the Fablemans, which I also have not seen, which is some Tony Kushner Spielberg joint. I yeah, guess. we need to stop making movies that are love letters to cinema. I don't. Want oh that. yeah, yeah. I don't want that. Uh, Tar, which we have talked about and yes. which everyone seems incapable of reading, which it is in fact <laughs> a satire and it is in fact a very good movie. I would actually say it is a much better movie than Everything Ever All at Once, which does not mean that if you like Everything Ever All at Once, like I do. And indeed, I identify with it as an immigrant child. Yep. Um, it does not like my appreciation of tar does not in fact diminish my enjoyment of everything everywhere all at once. There is not a scarcity of cultural enjoyment to go around. Um, right. What was that line that you were quoting to me from Adorno before? 
Um, fun is a medicinal bath, which the entertainment industry never ceases to prescribe. It makes laughter the instrument for cheating happiness. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like we have to ignore that, like, one of the things that helps us understand a movie like Everything Ever All at Once is not that it won the fucking Academy Award, or that it won, right, it won more than any film ever or something yeah. like this, which, by the way, is just fucking dumb. Like, but what that actual line from, from the captain of negativity, uh, Teddy Adorno, right, uh, helps me understand actually where, like, yep. the Hollywood convention tripped up this otherwise pretty good movie, yeah. right? Because it had to give in to the fun story. It had to give in to the Pat story. Yep. It had to sell me happiness. It had to sell me fun as a medicinal bath. It couldn't actually... And it had to sell you closure. It, did, it couldn't tinge that yeah. fun. Yeah, with a lack of closure or with something that would have, I think, that we hinted at at the very beginning or discussed yeah. at the very beginning, which is that an alternative way that this film could have resolved its multiple, you know, tensions and, and craziness yeah. and all the thing was, would be with the dissolution of right. their, the happy dissolution of their family. But as it is, there's no, there's no residue. There's nothing that sticks. There's no, like melancholy is interesting. I don't, uh, Pat yes. is not. So, um, so the thing I think that we're coming to a, a close with here in many ways, I mean, go ahead. Oh, I just, I've, I have two more details about this year's Oscars to share oh, yeah, that yeah, I think yeah. are especially. I, mean, I didn't even finish that, I mean, that list because there's like 13 movies in this fucking uh, list. Yeah. Um, that are kind of especially ominous. One, apparently there was a, you know how sometimes they do that little silly like montage of clips from different like genres or, or whatever. I don't know. I haven't seen the Oscars in years. This year they did a montage of clips um, that focused on like studio achievements. Oh, so that's we got fucking like, crazy. We got like a kind of Disney montage and a like kind of featuring. So it would be like everything from the cartoons through start, like through Marvel and Star Wars. Something like that. Oh my and God. we got an in awards, ser- not kind of the, not the kind of, um, uh, on the network, but we got an in-ceremony advertisement for the Little Mermaid live-action film. Oh, but see, this is... Uh, I actually read a wonderful thing about this, and I wish I could remember to give credit, um, that, like, the Disney live... I, I've never really understood these Disney live-action things until some... Again, this is why critical engagement is so important. I've never understood that until I read someone's article. I was like, is this just... Like, why do they do this? Why not remake... If you want to make Little Mermaid, why not make a second or a third or a fourth cartoon? Why not reboot the cartoon? Like, this is all within the logic we've been talking about with reboots and all that kind of right. stuff forever. And this person in whatever article, and I, I just wish I could remember who it was, um, pointed out that, in fact, the it's clear that the Disney execs know that the shelf life of the live action version is really short. So I put out a new version of... Uh, of The Little Mermaid. I put out a, a new version of, um, what was that Will Smith movie? Um, Aladdin, right? N- or Mulan, right? Knowing that, in fact, the live action version is going to fade very quickly in memory and will just serve as a sort of ad for the uh, evergreen cartoon version. And part of the way this is again, brings us back to this the idea. The cartoon of, version, which, by the way, for me, is one of the good D- Disney films of the 90s. Well, so this was something I was going to come up, I was gonna, I wanted to bring up, because, again, there is this kind of Whiggish pr- idea of progress mm-hmm. in, like, the narrative of something like Everything Everywhere All at Once, where it's like, finally, we have achieved, we've gotten there. We've like, it's it's like Hegel's dialectical process has finally delivered us the end of cinema. And like- We we, got the most cinema in a movie. Well, no, that's Avatar. (laughs) Uh, But, right, uh, no, 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 but like, in this way that like reflects like, oh, Clearly, there has never been celebrated Asian cinema before. I mean, that is just untrue. Um, but like the the logic with um, with these Disney live adaptations, as this article pointed out, is like they always have to uh, 
ascribe that motivation. They're like, oh, in the new version of The Little Mermaid, it's much more realistic. She's given, um, she has motivations other than love and men. But if you go back and actually watch, and I'm a huge fan of this, uh, you are clearly a much bigger fan, but if you actually go back and watch, it's literally, I think, one of the most famous songs in the original film, uh, where she's like, everything that interests her about life on land has nothing to do with yep. uh, men or erotic attraction or yep. anything like which, that. Which, by the way, the Hans Christian and Anderson fa story is also about sublimating sexuality. Oh, right. The film itself, um, I, I should say, uh, that song. Uh, like, isn't it neat? It's all about like gadgets. And this life is the that's songwriting different. talent of Howard Ashman. Oh um, yes, the wonderful, 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 and brilliant Howard Ashman. Um, uh, and that song is actually that's the film that saved Disney because yeah. he came on and said, "What you're trying to do and what you're not doing is um, uh, you need to be basically staging this as a like a Broadway show." Yes, that's um, right. But the, the, the point being in many ways that like you have to ascribe to that kind of Hegelian or yep, Whiggish view of, yeah, of totally. progress to make those live action remakes make sense. Right. And thus you are sold a shittier product yep. than the thing that you loved, right? In the name of fun. And then the, the sort of genius of capitalism, the, the thing that always amazes my students, right, is that your own desires, your own impulses, even your own critical impulses are many ways uh, scooped up and spat back at you yep. to sell the newest thing, yes. to sell the next iteration. Yes. And now that everything everywhere all at once apparently has been so successful, these guys will sell you the next Star Wars. Yes. Um, they have um, they have like registered what what clicks for people like what what yes. kind of what what it is it's that makes market a fan base. research it is it is and like I don't want to be like again this and is Adorno with the thumb down saying no and uh, yes we're not in fact letting you enjoy things yes because a critical engagement is enjoyable. Yes. B, it is socially relevant. Yes. And C, what you are being sold, just like a, like a aisle of a thousand toothpastes, is a commodity for profit. Like, and the same way you can be like, and wow. That, and that's this the piece case, of that's the case for every, yeah. every film. Yeah. yeah. Watch. <laughs> I mean, even some of the like stuff that I think both of us would love. I mean, it depends. In some countries, it really isn't. I, when you're talking Tarkovsky, he did not actually yes. have to turn a, a profit on those films. Uh, and I think he would have had a rough time doing so. Um, although those are great movies. Uh, and they're enchanting. And it's, again, you have to ascribe to a view. Um, again, we uh, look at last year's Dune. Oh, man. Like, like and I, don't, I don't even know what this movie Coda is. Dune, one. Dune Part One. Yeah, Dune Part One, one. which was like, it's not okay. Go get me wrong. It's like an okay movie. They nominated that horrible Adam McKay climate change movie, Don't Look Up, that was straight to fucking Netflix. Are you fucking kidding me? People, I swear to God, there is nothing of value here. There is nothing here that reflects anything about art. It reflects commerce. Right. And we know we know this because, uh, in addition, because uh, as we've seen in the past couple of years, the Oscars itself has um, cut from the main. Oh, uh, that's so perfect! From yes. the main uh, broadcast, a whole bunch of categories that they see as kind of irrelevant that, that they think people won't be interested in. So, uh, you know, technical categories um, that would or make they're the shown off too screen. Long. Right, they happen in a ceremony before the main broadcast. Um, so that our enjoyment of, so that we'll stay the whole event. I actually think the platonic ideal of the award show has been achieved not with the Oscars, um, but it's increased, I, I haven't watched any of these for a long time, but it is in fact the Game Awards, um, which was founded I think very recently, like I wanna say five or six years ago by Jeff Keighley. Um, and why do I say this? Because the awards are completely irrelevant to the show. The awards are mostly done off screen or like very quickly as like an intro. They're like, oh, by the way, uh, best animation goes to like these 13 guys from Vietnam. Moving on, like our 16 ads for the next 25 games. And like, 
right? That is the platonic ideal of the award show. And it's funny that you mentioned this, the shift from like actor montages or director montages in to some ways studio it's a more truthful company. it's a more truthful yeah. version of the academy the Awards. irony yeah. right the irony is like what do they do when it disney just owns everything right like when like i guess it's disney and it's, sony pictures and the, universal right, is the it's last the disney thing. steve jobs event or whatever it's just like the the, the kind of the annual like um internal will, will they nominate the super mario movie as best picture next year I, Which, again, a two hour, I mean, ad for video games. Excruciating. <laughs> but probably, right? Um, Izzy, do you have anything else to say here? Um, just that I, I, I like, I genuinely recognize the like deep love and affection that people have for cultural objects like this. And I want to insist on the pleasures of criticism. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's the idea, I think going back to uh, Kate's piece and your addendum to Kate's piece, it's the, it, it is a false antithesis to say that those things can't yeah. live side by side. I will say, I do think there's a little bit of, we're still coming out a little bit of the hangover of, of sort of the idea in that was very powerful. Again, we have slightly different age, but like when I was in college in the late nineties, it was very powerful. This idea of like fandoms and, and popular cultures mm -hmm. sort of taking hold of objects and making them their own. And it showed, you know, in this sort of very bad reading of a Foucauldian power analysis, like how people could like take things and, and rearrange them and stuff. But like, I, I am still drawn back to Teddy on that stuff where I'm like, yeah, that's true. And it helps draw people further and further and further into incorporation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. And you see, you see the beginnings of that in a lot of um, fan fiction, which to, a, to some degree retained some amount of critical distance insofar as they were willing to like take it, like yeah. play with the text. Yeah. Um, but that really the sort of um, cons the, the like almost institutionalization of fan fiction, fan bases, all of this stuff yeah. is sort of, culminates in this reaction to a film like this. And the thing is, you can do it the other way around. So one of the other very interesting um, sort of reactions to this that I saw from what one might, you know, I'm using scare quotes, this is audio, you can't see the scare quotes, but like a supposedly like cinephile or elite critical attitude with people saying, oh, it's, it's very sad um, to see uh, in the wake of this doing so well that like Criterion is pushing all these mm. Chinese action movies, like here's a hundred Chinese action movies and here's 35% of them star Michelle Yeoh, here you go. Um, and being like, oh, this is like pandering, this is bullshit. No, no that's a good that thing. is critical education. Yeah, that's a good That thing. is literally, I'll tell you this as someone who's done this shit for like 11 years, right? That is what you do. That's your recommended fact, reading. You say like, look at this movie, isn't it interesting? Well, let's, let's peel back the layers. Let's peel back the onion, let's look at history, let's see all the interesting kind of filmmaking that actually trouble the Hollywood story yeah. of progress. In fact, many of these uh, early Chinese action films culminating with big grand epics people know, stuff like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, but going way back to the 70s and 80s, are actually brilliant yeah. movies um, that American cinema has learned tons from. Yeah. Um, not just Hong Kong cinema, mainland cinema, et cetera, et cetera. And like, it's actually like doing God's work, if you will, to like be like, hey, yes, let's look at this thing and pull further. Yeah. You know, I hope they do the same thing when like John Wick 4 comes out and they're like, let's look at Le Samurai and see how like this is drawing on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that's right. And on that note, do, you, uh, do we have any parting thoughts for the Oscars, for everything everywhere, all, everything everywhere all at once, or on not letting people enjoy things? Wow. Um, keep hating, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, haters for the win. Yeah. Uh, Teddy would approve. 
And uh, we don't have listener questions this week, uh, but uh, please do uh, write in or comment or get in touch with any of us. Um, you can send to info at thebrooklyninstitute.com. You can talk to us on Twitter. You can comment on the various uh Posts. Our handles will be in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we are more than happy to answer your questions and criticisms and engagements on the next episode. So thank you for listening uh, and enjoy. Take care. <laughs>